the fourth ashart al rabi' the fourth condition at taharatu min al najasati fi badanihi wa thawbihi wa mawdi'i salatihi purity from najasa in three things on his body on his thawb his garment and where he is praying so the first condition the first shart was to have at tahara min al hadath the fourth condition, at tahara min al najas. And there are two separate conditions. At tahara min al hadath means you have to have wudu, which is spiritual purity. At tahara min al najas means you cannot have physical impurity. Because you can be in the state of wudu, but you have physical najasa on you. So the fourth condition, at tahara min al najasa. You cannot have any najas in three places. On your body and your clothes and mawdi' salatihi, the area that you are praying in. Okay? Except for illa najasat al ma'fuwa anha, except for a najasa that is extremely small and overlooked. And he gives an example kayasir al dami wa nahwihi, like a small quantity of blood and things of this nature. Because small quantities of najasa are almost impossible to avoid. Small quantities of najasa are almost impossible to avoid. And this is where shaitan, unfortunately, causes many of us to have OCD. And we go too much in this regard. Okay? Waswas of shaitan. What is OCD? Obsessive compulsive disorder. You're always thinking that my hand's dirty. My, my underwear is now dirty, my did. So you're always having waswas. And our Prophet said this is waswas from shaitan. And a small amount of najasa, and that's why he puts it here. A small amount is overlooked. Now, simple example of this is that a, 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 a toddler who's in your house, right? It's understood that when they're being potty trained or whatever, there's going to be najasa here and there. You have cleaned it up. Okay? Now, if somebody were to do a chemical analysis, you will find najasa here, najasa there, najasa there. Right? But you have cleaned it up in whatever way the sharia allows. And the cleaning up, by the way, of a uh, child's urine is you just pour a bucket of water. So it's not even a bucket. He's urinated. You just pour water wherever he's done it. And the, the sharia says that's enough. Shaitan comes and says, oh, that's still najis. No, the sharia has allowed it. Okay? Or, and again, let me, sometimes fiqh is a bit explicit, so excuse me for this, but fiqh is explicit. It is impossible to cleanse yourself 100% after the bathroom. There will be remnants of either things, the urine or the stool. Especially if you only use tissue paper, which is halal, as we discussed in Tahara, when we did Tahara many years ago, whenever... I know it's surprising for those of you that did, did, did not attend, but by unanimous consensus of all of the scholars of Islam, without any difference of opinion, it is completely halal to restrict ourselves to toilet paper even after defecation. Completely halal. Without any haja, without any darura. It is halal. Now, because that's what the sharia has come with. It's not necessary to use water. Of course it's better to use water. By ijma' it's better to use water. That's why we use water. Alhamdulillah, the Muslim culture has adopted this. But fiqh says it's halal to restrict yourself to dry material. Now, if you restrict yourself to dry material, think about it. There is no way... By the way, even if you use water, chemically, of course there's going to be remnants. Right? So does the sharia require you to cleanse that? Impossible. Impossible. This is what al-ma'fuwi anha means. That trivial quantity... In the area of najasa, that's going to be expected. Okay? In the area of najasa is going to be expected, and it is forgiven. And this is an important phrase because, unfortunately, many Muslims do have OCD issues when it comes to salah. They have waswas, and they never stand up to pray properly. Whenever they stand up, shaitan comes to them, they say salam, and they go do it again, come back, and this is a problem. You get nothing done. And so here that is why he said And also blood He makes a simple example right? Blood If your nose starts bleeding Or you have a cut that's bleeding 
this is a small, it's not, everybody bleeds. If you were to stop your salah, break your salah because of a little blood, khalas, you could never pray. So, trivial blood is always going to be forgiven. So this is why he makes this example, that, and the same goes for the praying salah as well. So, uh, suppose you are, يعني, have blood on your clothing as well. Little bit of blood spots, no problem. It's not going to make, a, and especially, again, you have a toddler who's bleeding or whatever. I mean, things, things happen. Or najasa of the toddler comes onto you and you just clean it with water. Little bit of najasa, ma'fuun anha. Now, the, the phrase is clear. Of course, the questions will arise, what is little bit of najasa? And that's where the fuqaha differ. And that's also where even within the madhab you'll find. But you understand the concept, and that is, what is trivial and overlooked should not be made a factor in the salah. Is that clear? That's the main point. Okay? And the simple example is Yasir al dam a little bit of dam. وَإِن صَلَّى وَعَلَيْهِ نَجَاسَةً وَلَمْ يَكُنْ عَلِمَ بِهَا أَوْ عَلِمَ بِهَا ثُمَّ نَسِيَهَا فَصَلَاتُهُ صَحِيحًا And if he prayed with a najasa, and he didn't know there was najas. So, Simple example is that he prayed wearing his thobe or whatever. Then his wife tells him, oh my God, why did you pray in that? Our son, our daughter sat on that and there's urine on it. And I wanted to put on the, in the washing, but you wore it for the salah. Okay? So he prayed without realizing that there was urine on it. Or, even if he was told, but he forgot. And he wore the shirt and he forgot. فَصَلَاتُهُ صَحِيحًا why? Because at the time he thought all of the shurut are met. And he didn't know there's no shurut missing. So we said that something that's beyond his control and ignorance and forgetfulness is beyond your control. You will not be penalized by the sharia. Okay? Which means if it was in your control and you knew it, then you will be penalized. And so your salah will be batil. So if you prayed in a shirt or a garment, or an undergarment, you know there's najis. And it's not a trivial amount. And you have an alternative, but you do not do it. Your salah is batil. Your salah is batil. It is not accepted because you were lazy, you knew it, and you didn't follow the shurut. How, what, what if you found out in the salah? When alima biha fi fis salati azalaha wa bana ala salatihi. If he discovered during the salah, then he gets rid of that one garment, if he's able to, without breaking the other shurut, which is his aura. And he continues praying and his salah is valid. This is based on the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim muttafaq alayh, that one day the Prophet wasallam was praying, and in the middle of the salah, he took off his shoes and put them to the side. By the way, this shows us he was praying in his shoes in his masjid, which was his common habit, by the way. All, all the time he would pray in his shoes because the, shoe, the, the floor was gravel. The floor was sand. It wasn't carpet. They would pray with their shoes. When the Prophet took his shoes off, all of the Sahaba behind him took their shoes off and put it to the side. Just following, blind following. That's what Islam tells us to do. When the Salah finished, the Prophet said, why did you take your shoes off? They said, you took your shoes off. We're just following you. You took your shoes, we took our shoes. So he said, Jibreel came to me and informed me that my shoes have some najis, some adha, which means some najis on. That's why I took it off. Meaning I have a reason. Now, what does this show us? Well, you can pray with your shoes on. That's true. If you come to know during the salah, that one of your garments has najis, you take it off, and how about what you've just prayed with the najis on? It's accepted. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't make it up. Clear? Very explicit hadith. He did not make it up. Okay? So, simple example. Same example of the child urinating on the shirt. Your wife screams out to you, while you're in salah. Oh, you, that shirt has najis on it. And you have your undershirt on. So in the salah, you will unbutton the shirt. This is an action for the salah. Or you will take your thobe, as long as you're wearing your undershirt and your pajamas or whatever, and you will get rid of this garment. And your salah will continue unaffected. 
at whatever point you realize. Because now, if you're not able to do this without uh, exposing your aura, then you must stop the salah. And you must do the taslim, break the salah, then go and change, and then start all over again. Okay? Because you're not allowed to expose your aura you know, when you have time and when you have, when you have you know, no reason uh, to do it. You have an alternative. You have other clothes. In this case, you're not allowed to continue uh, and you will have to break the salah and then change and then come back. And uh, as well if you remembered, as well if you remembered, okay? So, uh, uh, and again, the, uh, again, the, the reality is these are, these are real life scenarios that suppose that uh, you went to the restroom, let's say in your workplace, you weren't able to clean yourself properly, and you know you haven't cleaned yourself properly. Okay? So, you, f you, you, you know that you are not in the state of tahara in terms of from the najasa. By the way, that should never happen, because even if you use toilet paper, you are fine. But suppose, yani whatever, or an accident happens, let's say. A little bit of urine comes out once in a while. If something happens. Then you forget, and then you stand up to pray. You remember in the salah, oh my God, my undergarments have najis on them. You have to stop. Because you cannot take your undergarments off without exposing your aura. You have to break the salah. And you have to start from the beginning after you change into something that is pure. Okay, so uh, the next phrase is وَالْأَرْضُ كُلُّهُ مَسْجِدْ تَصِحُّ الصَّلَاةُ فِيهَا إِلَّا الْمَقْبَرَةُ وَالْحَمَّامُ وَالْحُشْ now, he now moves on to the next phrase, which is, where can one pray? The whole world is considered a masjid. Where do we get this from? Our Prophet wasallam said, Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, Allah has made the whole world a masjid, and a pure place for me. This is only for us Muslims. The previous ummas were not allowed to pray except in their places of worship. And they had special rulings. Our Prophet ﷺ said, Allah blessed me with certain things He didn't bless anybody before me with. And of them, He said, the whole earth has been made a masjid and a tahur for me. So we can pray anywhere in the world on glaciers, in the desert, on mountains, on grass, in the fields, sand dunes, everywhere in the world is halal. And this is only for our ummah. No ummah before us was given this uh, blessing. And, uh, the, and therefore the whole world is halal. So then what is not allowed? He mentions four places. Number one, al-maqbara. Al-maqbara, the graveyard. And the reason why we do not pray in the graveyard is because there is, it is a stepping stone to venerating the dead. Not because the graveyard is najis, but because the graveyard is a place that we do not bow our head down in. Because there's qubur everywhere. Okay? So we're not supposed to lower our head in front of a human, dead or alive. Correct? So therefore the graveyard... And pretty much all the madahib have this. Not because the graveyard is najis, but because we don't want to lower our head intentionally in front of another human, even a dead human. We don't lower our head in front of that. So the graveyards are off limits. Al-Hammam. What is the Hammam? No, not the bathroom. No, not the toilet. Bath house. Hammam is the bath house. The Turkish Hammam. Right, when the books of fiqh mention hammam, they don't mean bathrooms or toilets. They mean what we would call shower places. Right? Why? Because in the shower places, obviously, the water is going to be coming that is going to be composed of najis, basically. Right? It's not appropriate to... to... Now, by the way, these examples, we can make qiyas on our lives. Okay? So we don't play in the places where the water is coming and that water is cleansing the najis. So we're not going to pray in those places. Wal hush. And hush is the land that was used for restroom because they didn't have flushing toilets. What would the people of those times would do? They would have certain plots of land that were known to be restroom areas. 
That's called hush. And of course, hush because you do not know where is najis and where is not. So in our times, basically, the restroom. Now, here's the point. So if somebody were to say that our restrooms do not actually have najasa in them, we respond, true. But they are places of najasa. Just like the hammam. Technically, the hammam does not have najasa in it. But the hammam, we mean the old hammam. Turkish hammam. Technically, the hammam does not have najasa there, does it? You, you understand what I'm saying? Still, the hammam is the place of najasa. Right? It's not the healthiest or the cleanest place. Not the healthiest. Okay. The cleanest place to pray. So we say, similarly, you are correct. Our modern toilets, our modern restrooms do not actually have najas in them. But we still do not allow prayer because these are the places of najasa. And the salah is not befitting in places of najasa. Like the hammam. Clear? Okay. So, salah is not allowed in maqbara, in hammam, in hush, and a'tan al-ibl. A'tan al-ibl is camel pens. Camel pens. And this is also one of the unique uh, positions of the Hanbali madhab. Camel pens is one of the unique positions of the Hanbali madhab. None of the other madhabs hold it because uh, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said in a hadith in Sahih Muslim that uh, a man asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, can I pray in sheep's pen? And he said, Naam, yes. Then the man said, Can I pray in camel's pen? He said, No. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So based on this, the Hanbali Madhab took it. And they said, Khalas, camel's pen, not allowed. Just because the Hadith, there's no rational reason. Okay? The camel is a tahir animal. It's not, it's not as if the camel is nudges, obviously. The camel is a tahir animal. Uh, and therefore, uh, and uh, this will also shock you because we haven't studied fiqh, you're studying it for the first time. The defecation and urine of tahir animals is also tahir. I know that sounds bizarre to most of you, but if you lived on a farm, you would know this instantaneously. You wouldn't need fiqh to teach you this. Okay? You cannot prevent yourself from cow dung and whatnot. And it might be disgusting, but it doesn't make it najis. The defecation and urine of that which is eaten, such as cow and sheep and goats, is not najis. That doesn't mean you astaghfirullah, smear yourself in it. It might be disgusting, okay. But it's not najis, which means, which means if you pray and, and there's something over there, so, I mean, imagine realistically goat droppings. They will be everywhere in a valley. I mean, again, for us living in the cities, mashallah, we are completely isolated. But if anybody who lives amongst and with animals, you know, this is logical, completely logical. Completely rational. The droppings of animals that are pure are considered pure. And they are not considered najis. However, the Hanbali Madhab says just camel pens. Not because camels are najis. Simply because the hadith. Why? We don't know. And the other three Madhab, they have their own reasons. Maybe safety reasons, whatever. They have their own reasons. And they, they don't say this. In any case, this is the Hanbali Madhab.